The following program features archival footage from World War II. All of the images are real. Some are extremely graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. Japan, land of the rising sun. In 1945, these Pacific islands are engulfed by total war. In this film, we track the United States Army as it takes the final steps towards mainland Japan in a relentless fight to the death. It was uh, that the hardest place ever was. From brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, to a new weapon that changes the face of warfare forever. A moment of immense sudden destruction. Featuring newsreels of the time. Peace has once again come to the world. Rare and enhanced archive footage and the testimonies of those who were there. He was stuck. And on the way home, he hardly said a word or heard a word spoken. This is World War II, witness to war. Europe, summer 1944. A huge Allied land invasion of Nazi-occupied France is underway. To the east, a Soviet Red Army counterattack forces the Wehrmacht into retreat towards Germany. But Adolf Hitler's Third Reich isn't the only nation on a collision course. The forces of the Allies must converge on Tokyo from every direction. Fleets and armies must close in with all speed and power on the capital of the Japs. Tokyo, 1944. Japanese Supreme Commander Hideki Tojo and his generals know that Japan's empire is collapsing about them. They do verbal gymnastics in their own news broadcasts to explain that they're pulling back strategically with the next battle. But many in Japan could see somewhat the writing on the wall that this was certainly now uh, the beginning of the end. Resources are dwindling, and Japan's war machine is grinding to a halt. Japan had the resources, actually, to match US production. The Pacific War very well could have been this very long war of attrition in which you had battle after battle after battle, in which the US maybe would have become exhausted and started to negotiate some kind of end to the war that preserved the Japanese empire. The United States shows no interest in negotiating peace with an enemy that's unwilling to back down. Japan has defended every island across the Pacific far beyond the rational point of surrender. After reclaiming the Philippines, American forces are now determined to crush what remains of Japan's island empire once and for all. Iwo Jima, February 1945. This tiny Japanese military outpost is the next crucial stepping stone towards mainland Japan. The officers briefed us, they had a map of this little island was shaped like a pork chop, two miles by four miles, and he said, here's this volcano, extinct volcano. The Navy had been bombing it for 102 straight days. Landing was, uh, we landed about the 10th wave. Uh, we were getting a lot of mortar fire on the beach, not too much long range machine gun fire. First day was uh, pretty calm. We flushed out some Japanese out of a pillbox, killed about five or six of them, and uh, that was about it for the first day for us. But as US troops advance from the shoreline, it's clear that the closer they get to Japan, the tougher the fight will become. The significant thing about the battle, I think, is that the Japanese decided to adopt a different strategy. Instead of relying on uh, attacks on the beaches, 
They withdrew into the interior, found places that they could hide and conceal their artillery caves where they could um, snipe at American forces, making sure that the Americans would pay for every yard of ground that they took on, on Iwo Jima. The volcanic landscape proves treacherous. Despite the bombardment, the flamethrowers and grenades, Japanese forces remain dug in and defiant. There was caves, holes in the, in the banks and stuff, and rocks. It was a, that the hardest place ever was to get the people out of. You had to burn them out and blow them out. The 21st of February, was an all-out attack on the base of the mountain, which had around 100 pillboxes. By evening, we had cleaned out the area, and uh, the average loss, I think, was about 30 percent. We got 100 rounds of ammunition in an hour, and they still couldn't advance. We were done that for 30 days. They killed a lot of our men. Of course, we killed a lot of them. U.S. casualties are colossal. Iwo Jima was so bad, well, they had a lot of, of um, deaths, and they would ship them. They shipped them home for burial, and that's what the ships were used for it. And they would be filled going through. They'd stop and pick up some of our people, but they had so many bodies, too. It was just terrible. About 7,000 people killed Marines. And all together, wounded and killed, was 20-something thousand Marines. And uh, Japanese, it was 20-something thousand killed. On March the 26th, the US Army declares victory. But that victory comes at an appalling cost. The horrors of Iwo Jima will forever scar the minds of those who survive. I was three weeks into my 21st year, and I saw mounds and mounds and mounds of dead Japanese bodies waiting for mass burial. Were, bulldozers were out digging the ground up and pushing these bodies into it. And, and the smell of, 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 of rot, rotting flesh is, is in my mind today as I'm talking to you. In many respects, Iwo Jima is insignificant. It wasn't necessary to attack the home islands of Japan. And we have to bear in mind that that is the final goal. There were perhaps four operations, bombing operations launched from Iwo Jima. And there is certainly lots of contentious debate about whether that justifies the death toll in taking Iwo Jima itself. By the time Iwo Jima is captured, American long-range bombing missions over mainland Japan are already underway. The Marianas, March the 9th, 1945. American B-29 superfortresses take flight. The first air raid came a little after 10 o'clock. It came in a flash. Each plane carries more than seven tons of incendiary bombs. The target, Tokyo. The full force of the raid hit when Mother woke me. All was in a terrible uproar with great loud noises everywhere. When we went out, everything was bright red. Everywhere, incendiary bombs were falling. The wind and flames became terrific. We are in hell. All the houses were burning, debris raining down on us. It was horrible. Sparks flew everywhere. Outside the world was ablaze. We had no more water. It was all gone. The operation is the single most devastating bombing raid in history. The fascinating thing, or the horrific thing in many ways, about the Tokyo fire bombings is that the Americans realized that by dropping napalm bombs in on Tokyo, because of the small wooden structure of houses, they would burn and they would create a firestorm. And essentially, they created mini volcanoes all around Tokyo over a several day period. 
I made 19 trips over Japan, plus some of these other missions. And little fires became big fires, and then the big fires sent up the smoke to 20,000 feet. And not once did I think that there were human beings on the ground. I never had a thought that there were people on the ground. Even after all the bones were buried, when it rained, a blue flames burned from the phosphorus. Soldiers stationed there used to say, maybe they'll come out tonight, thinking of the ghosts and the blue flames. The majority of the damage was done by incendiaries, and something like three quarters of the city is estimated to have been wiped out. Although Japan's capital suffers terrible destruction, the will of the Japanese people to continue fighting remains strong. The mass urban bombing of Japan arguably had little effect into altering the opinion of the Japanese, whether to surrender earlier or later. And it was really other issues uh, that played into that. Spring 1945. The United States campaign in the Pacific is almost over. Only one battle remains before the US is able to launch an all-out invasion of mainland Japan. The island of Okinawa has been part of Japan for more than a century. As one of the Japanese home islands, it's heavily defended. On April the 1st, 1945, the US launches its largest amphibious assault in the Pacific yet. Heroic dead of a combined army and marine force marked the grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war is being fought. In desperation, Japan throws everything it has against the US forces. At sea, off Okinawa, a furious naval battle rages. The United States Navy fleet is attacked full strength by the Japanese Imperial Air Force. This was very difficult battle, very costly for the uh, Americans to conquer Okinawa. As the US troops slowly gain ground, Japanese soldiers are willing to pay the ultimate price in defense of their home soil. Certain death was how the war had been propagated to the Japanese, that one went into battle not thinking about return, but about killing as much of the enemy as possible and probably dying yourself. And that, of course, makes the decision for a suicide much easier. Each small advance is gained by sheer grit in the face of withering fire from a suicidal enemy being slowly hammered back into the hill. On the 20s, large guns stopped firing and they began burning things with flamethrowers. We were smoked out onto the cliff tops. We friends promised each other if I'm unable to move or you are disabled, I'll give you cyanide. We each kept a hand grenade like a talisman. If we stand up, they'll shoot us, we thought. So we stood up. We walked upright with dignity, but they held their fire. What we see on Okinawa, it's a larger scale slaughter on both sides. The Americans advance extremely slowly. It's a battle that requires several months. But what we also see on a much larger scale than we had seen before is the impact this has now on Japanese civilians. Okinawans wanting to, in many respects, demonstrate themselves as good imperial subjects and as proper Japanese people. One of our enduring memories, of course, are Okinawans committing mass suicides, leading bonsai charges, that sort of thing against uh, invading uh, US forces. Many Japanese civilians believe that U.S. occupation is a fate worse than death. I can still recite the clauses of Senjinkun. It said, you must not bring disgrace on yourself to be a prisoner as long as you are alive. You must not leave your name dishonorable even after you die. We absolutely weren't allowed to be a prisoner. We had been taught that death was beautiful and that death for the emperor was the best honor. We had taken it as gospel since we were children. Many Japanese people believed there would be widespread massacres. 
that the United States would treat them very horribly. And I don't think that that's an unreasonable position to have considering the firebombing campaign. It's estimated that almost 150,000 Okinawans die defending their island. The US now knows that if the Japanese are prepared to fight to the death for one small home island, an invasion of mainland Japan will come at an enormous cost in American lives. From the American point of view, the end of the war in the Pacific was going to be very difficult. The assumption was that Japanese society would be mobilized to the full to resist uh, 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 Allied invasion. Tokyo, summer 1945. Japan is now completely isolated from its empire. The population is tired, they're exhausted. They've been now waging war in some form or another since the early 1930s, and they've been deprived of various elements of a comfortable lifestyle one step at a time to kind of descend to the penury that they're living in by 1945. In fact, in Japan, efforts have been made to find a way of surrendering for months. Political factions, even military factions in Japan, were desperately trying to get to the emperor, trying to persuade him that they, you know, they had to surrender rather than uh, bear more costs. This war made us suffer so much from burning injuries and deaths. Because of all this, I felt that it did not matter whether we won the war or lost. The blind trust of the Japanese in their military leadership is beginning to fade. Coming out of the 1930s, people thought the military was an institution they could trust. And now it looks like it's led them into a disastrous war and it can't even defend them anymore. In some cases, Japanese people leaving burning cities were ordered by military officials to go back in and fight the fires. This is the point at which I think the civilian population really turns against the military and are desperate for the war to end. Unaware of the war weariness in Japan, US commanders are desperate for an alternative to a full-scale invasion, one that will force the empire to surrender. New Mexico, July 1945. Scientists assemble in the desert for an experiment that's part of a top-secret program known as the Manhattan Project. Their aim is to create a weapon that will change the course of the war altogether. When the uh, war broke out, uh, I joined Lawrence at Berkeley. There was one doubt that I had in my mind. And, you know, would it explode? I mean, it's very easy to get uh, fissionable materials, and all of us could see how you could put it together and it heat up and all that sort of a thing. I mean, uh, would you get a bomb from it? I can remember uh, Lawrence saying with full confidence that that's not the problem. He was absolutely 100% confident. He had no, no doubt whatsoever. Uh, he said that now, uh, in order for this to be useful, this has got to be ready uh, in July of 1945, or the project will be a failure. Before the atomic weapons were first tested at the Trinity site in 1945, it was not entirely agreed what the effect of a nuclear explosion would be. There was a theory that a nuclear explosion could result in a chain reaction in which every bit of air on Earth would catch fire and the world would be destroyed. So until you explode your first test nuclear weapon, you don't know what's going to happen. On July the 16th, the Manhattan Project physicists, led by Robert Oppenheimer, attempt a first detonation. Yeah, I was working at, at Los Alamos that, that day that they dropped the bomb in, in uh, Alamogordo. Security was, of course, military police, and they checked you going in, going out. Of course, we didn't know what they were really doing. It wasn't up to us. 
but uh, it was strange materials that we were uh, using. We were on the slope of that, uh, where you get, it was at like a uh, 45 degree angle, and just laying on the slope, waiting for the bomb to go up. You know, if you're in the kitchen, and uh, somebody opens the oven door, and a little warm air comes out, that's about it, the way it felt 10 miles away. Like a warm breeze coming. It's just all, all different colors all mixed together, but moving around. It, it, it can't, it's not all one color. Somebody left a, a radio on. They played this Star Spangled Banner at the same time that the bomb went off. The Americans theoretically understand the destructive power of the atomic bomb, and they are certainly aware that they're going to be dropping it on a civilian population, even though that civilian urban population has armament centers within it. But they've already had massive bombing campaigns of Tokyo, a civilian setting, so the moral step to drop the atomic bomb is not a step too far. But they're not quite sure of will they be able to deliver it, get it to Japan, and then of course dropping it on an urban center is not the same as setting it off in the middle of the desert on a stable structure. The Mariana Islands, August the 6th, 1945. Under the orders of US President Harry S. Truman, American air crews prepare for a top secret bombing mission. Three B-29 bombers are preparing for takeoff. Their destination, Japan. The lead plane, the Enola Gay, carries a new weapon created by the Manhattan Project. When we flew individually, we met up at Iwo Jima. We became the third plane. Then we flew off the wing of the Enola Gay until we got to our aiming point. The only piece of information that I remember them talking about was, since it's a new bomb, do not fly through the cloud. US scientists and military strategists are eager to see what the full impact of the weapon will be. At that time, there were five cities selected, and fortunately, I can only recall four of them there's today. That was Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Kukura, and Niigata. Those were the cities that were selected, and General Arnold ordered General LeMay not to strike them under any circumstance until further instructions. In many respects, it was an experiment. Um, the US military and the scientists who were behind the project needed to see its, its maximum impact. They didn't know what it would do to a city. They didn't know what it would do to human bodies. They could guess, but they wanted to see. The first target is the city of Hiroshima. There was a certain amount of anxiety about whether you really could use this or how you might use it. But in the end, that was overridden because the Americans thought they would get really heavy casualties when they invaded the Japanese home islands, that the bomb might be a shortcut to Japanese surrender. So the go-ahead was given. The night before, the sky was full of shooting stars, and I thought, that's strange. We were flying on that heading toward the city of Hiroshima when a radio went dead. When that radio went dead, the scientists aboard our airplane started a stopwatch. He pushed a button and the camera. saw it inside that airplane and the, the whole sky lit up. My tail gunner sitting in the back says, here it comes, meaning here comes the shock wave. And that's what we wanted. So when the shock wave hit me, I said, there is success. 
First it starts off, it's just 2,000 feet high approximately. Then she starts blossoming off. You see all sorts of colors in there. By the time we got near the city of Hiroshima, the bomb was higher than we were. There was nothing but a black boiling uh, mess hanging over the city and actually obscuring everything but something on the outskirts. So you wouldn't have known that the city of Hiroshima was there unless you'd seen it coming in. After the bomb was dropped, we were stunned. And on the way home, he hardly said a word or heard a word spoken. The devastation caused by one single bomb is unlike anything ever seen before. The fireball in the sky was brilliant. In spite of the brightness up there, it was as silent as a graveyard on the earth. The rim of the halo-like cloud flashed in rainbow colors. It was intensely hot. The surroundings were the sea of fire, and we were hot and not able to go forward anymore. A lot of badly burnt women fell down and cried over there. Give me water, give me water. The Japanese don't know what's been dropped on them. They don't know what an atomic bomb is. They've never been told about it. It's a moment of immense, sudden destruction. And it kills indiscriminately young, old, male, female. The fire began to grow bigger, and the ones who could not stand the heat started to jump into the river. It was that hot. No one made it to the other side. I wanted to drink water madly. The thirst was killing me. My eyes were swollen, and I could not tell who was who around me. It's estimated that almost 80,000 Japanese are killed instantly by the bomb. The face of warfare has changed forever. There were hundreds of injured people around there. Seeing them, I realized how cruel this bomb was. I thought this was the very hell on earth. President Truman calls for an immediate, unconditional Japanese surrender. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a reign of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. But during the days that follow, there's no sign of surrender. So on August the 9th, another top secret bombing mission begins. This time, the target is Nagasaki. The use of a nuclear device was intended to show the Japanese people that the entire population of the Japanese home islands could be killed by aerial bombardment until there was nobody left. The Nagasaki mission did not go nearly as smooth as the Hiroshima. They got up to Nagasaki, the weather was bad, and they played around almost an hour up there hunting for a hole through which they could drop the bomb. Sure enough, the Bombardier did find an opening and dropped it. The second atomic bomb instantly kills over 50,000 Japanese. But it's not just the initial explosion that's so destructive. The effects of the atomic bombs were horrific. Thousands and thousands of others suffered the effects of radiation, radiation sickness, the loss of skin, terrible burns and so on. And they filtered out 
into the surrounding countryside, and people were horrified, couldn't understand what had happened. In the aftermath, we read accounts of fathers not being able to recognize their own children because the skin is dripping off of them and they, they look like kind of a melting wax monster. The shadows of individuals burning into the concrete of people suddenly not existing because of the immense destructive power of the atomic, atomic bomb has literally pulverized them uh, to dust. As a medical doctor, I treated the victims of the atomic bomb. Blood spots and purple spots caused by internal bleeding started to show up on their skin. Once the symptoms were reported, tumors grew in their mouths and their gums started to bleed. The victims were suffering from external injuries and internal functional disorder. But above all, it was a radiation injury that covered the great majority. They went one by one. August 1945. In an attempt to bring an end to the war, the United States drops two atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Most of the city appears to have been obliterated. The US hopes that the bombs will be enough to force a Japanese surrender and make a land invasion unnecessary. Something that was, I still remember so clearly, as we're crossing the ocean to Japan, it could look down on the seas around Japan and see the, the extent of our preparation for landing. It was breathtaking. As far as you can see in every direction were ships. And if this was going to be the intent or the difference between using the weapon and not using the weapon, then whatever numbers they had uh, anticipated, I think would have been understated. I think initially response to the use of the atomic weapon, unless you had a really powerful moral or theological argument against using a, such a weapon against civilians, uh, was relief that the U.S. had found a weapon to end the war. People just wanted the war to be over at that stage. We were at war. They started it. It's our turn to finish it. And they saved lo lots of lives. And if they would not have capitulated when they did, there'd be some more atomic bombs coming along. Despite the devastation caused by the two atomic bombs, Japan's determination to keep fighting remains. Ultimately, the American call for unconditional surrender demonstrated that they weren't quite sure of all the elements they needed to occupy Japan and to get Japan, in a sense, back on its feet. The Japanese are always struggling with, can we save elements of our national polity, of our kokutai? Can we keep the emperor? Had the Allies said yes to some of those conditions earlier, Arguably, a second atomic bomb might not have been necessary. After the first two bombs were dropped, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese didn't make quick enough decision to surrender. So General May asked me the question, have you got another one of those things? And I said, yes, we do have another one. He said, get it out here. The question is, what will the target be? And obviously, one of the most important ones was, well, why not Tokyo? Let's drop it on the emperor's palace. That'll impress them. But a possible third atomic bomb isn't the only threat bearing down on the Japanese. The army of another world power is advancing from the west. Manchuria, August the 9th, 1945. Just hours before the atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki, Russia's Red Army invades Japan's puppet state in China. I turned on the radio. It was about seven. An announcer read, News Britain, the Soviet Union has broken diplomatic relations and has declared war. The Soviets were coming. This war was short-lived. Against the Japanese army, we were drawn enormous strength. The same 5th Army in which I served before the surrender of Germany was sent to the Far East. We had superiority in numbers and weapons, and especially in the frontline experience. 
The Japanese didn't lack in courage. They were samurai, which voluntarily chained themselves to machine guns so they could not leave the position, and our losses turned out to be significant. Not less than 40,000 people wounded and dead. In less than a week, Soviet forces overpowered the Japanese. In the end, Japanese surrender owed something to the atomic bombers, but it owed more the threat from Russia. Desperate fear of Hirohito and others that the Russians would beat the Americans to Japan, that the Russians would sweep through Manchuria, as they do in mid-August, sweep down Korea, as they do, invade the Japanese home islands, and Japan would be turned into a communist state. From the Japanese military leadership's perspective, losing a city or two to an atomic bombing is, is awful, but it's not insurmountable. But what isn't insurmountable are Soviet tanks rolling into Japan. Faced with the threat of a Soviet invasion, Emperor Hirohito finally announces Japan's surrender. August the 15th becomes known to the Western Allies as VJ Day, victory in Japan. At last, World War II is over. Hirohito examined maps of the capital showing the enormous areas of ruin. It must have been obvious to him that surrender was the only course. It should have been clear to all Japanese that the so-called Son of Heaven, as a divinely inspired leader, had been bombed out. There was a broadcast of the voice of Japan's Emperor Hirohito, and we realized that the war was over. I said to my injured husband, Japan has lost the war, the war has ended. In Tokyo, many people cried at the Imperial Palace Plaza when they found out that Japan had been defeated in the war. The man who lived across from my house was in great pain as he shouted, kill me with a Japanese sword. We were having such an awful daily life that when we had, we lost the war, it didn't affect my heart at all. The shock of the emperor accepting defeat, the shock of the emperor accepting surrender, undermined not just the Japanese culture and Japanese politics, but undermined Japanese religion. When the god emperor of Japan humbled himself before enemies from overseas, their religion changed. Japan had to change everything in order to accept its defeat. Washington, D.C., August the 15th, 1945. Which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. News of Japan's surrender echoes around the world. The last of our enemies is laid low. Peace has once again come to the world. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. Washington is jubilant. And in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets. It was August the 15th that uh, I remember hearing all of these noises and fire, as I guess they were firecrackers or something uh, going off and wanted to know what was going on. And they said, the war is over, the war is over. When we pulled into New York Harbor, I was so emotional. I cried. It was just, and, and I wasn't alone. There were a lot of us that were that way. And when you see that come through up the Hudson and you see the Statue of Liberty after what had happened in the world, it just was overwhelming to us. And we were the first large group from Europe to come back after VJ Day into New York. I went straight to Times Square. Suddenly, I was grabbed by a sailor. And it wasn't that much of a kiss. It was more of a, a jubilant act that he didn't have to go back. I found out later. He was so happy that he did not have to go back to the Pacific where they already had been through the war. 
I was glad the war was over. Obviously, I was glad the war was over, but it was kind of a, a sad time, too, because, you know, we'd all be going off in different directions, and you form real close relationships and, and what have you. As prisoners of war are released from captivity and soldiers return home, the world reflects on a war that has cost more than 80 million lives. The conflict on land, at sea and in the air has brought total war, genocide and destruction on a previously unimaginable scale. We knew that a war, a war does not go on forever. And we also promised each other that somebody has to stay alive to tell what was going on in that hell. Actually, with the help of mother, to try to forget the past, I realized that living a normal life and continue being to be able to, to feel and enjoy that I was not destroyed. As the world slowly begins to rebuild, US soldiers in Japan witness the devastation and horror at first hand. It's a scene I shall never forget. Nothing was standing except a few factory chimneys. It looks so odd to see a barren wasteland with tall chimneys standing. In the near distance was an old Japanese woman, unafraid of the troop ship that docked in its port. Everyone we were told ran to the hills when they heard the Americans were going to come to their homeland. And I remember saying to the Japanese, what have we done to you? And the tears. It's a very rare thing to see a Japanese cry, I must say. Very rare thing. The tears all down his eyes, and he said, what have we done to each other? And from that moment, I felt at one with them. And to see the two cities and with all the people that were killed in that thing, it just brought the war home to me because I didn't realize you had anything that strong. And it really scared me. It taught me the first time what war was all about, I guess. But I was sure, wondered what, what it was going to be like in the future. Killing that many people at one time with one bomb. But I was glad we had it. The atomic bombs dropped on Japan in 1945 usher in a whole new age of warfare. An atomic age that sees different ideologies clash and former allies go head to head in an attempt to dominate the world.